I'm personally against it, so you could be for it, ma'am. Yeah. Is that you know they do they finish their engineering degree and immediately go for an MBA, no work ex in between. No, I think work experience is key. I do before personally the believe MBA. before the MBA. How would you explain to someone what venture debt was? It's a zero hundred. You're Correct. betting that this thing is going to go to hundred. You're not you're not betting for a ten or twenty. Or... And then what was the trigger that got you back to India? I'm sorry, but seeing kids on the New York subway. I was a little scandalized. So I think I started valuing the Indian sort of family values, the culture, and so that was my primary reason for moving back. Because I remember I've seen Seed Fund's portfolio. Yeah, yeah. Seed Fund had a very exciting and interesting portfolio. Uh, the partners there were pioneers, sort of, yeah, of what Seed Fund investing is. They were the first, which is why they they didn't have to even think of a name, right? I, I think we've also glorified founders into being sort of mini celebrities too early. Before someone's truly successful, blame social media and LinkedIn and partly, Twitter, I mean, uh, or, or is it just uh, P? I, I, I don't know who to blame for that. Founders need to be extremely careful and respectful of debt. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Money Talks. And today we've got, by very popular demand, by the way, <laughs> Tarana, uh, Tarana Lalwani. So Tarana I know, and I know each other because I was an angel investor. And I met Mumbai her Angels, yeah. Mumbai Angels, and I and I knew her before I made my first investment, <laughs> right? And Tarana at that time was starting her venture journey, which I found out later with Seed Fund. Yes. And so we've known each other on and off, and we've had you know yeah. I think we keep uh, messaging each other on social media platforms to catch up for coffee, and then we do it once every two years. So thankfully yes. we had one coffee such such coffee <laughs> conversation uh, uh, about a week ago, and I said, yeah. hey Tarana. <laughs> This Sunday, I'm doing uh, a podcast. Her. Can you make it? And she's like, she was yeah, gracious enough. Not gracious. I said, yeah. I might as well. Others, I'm not going to get a chance again for two years. <laughs> <laughs> He's too busy. <laughs> so, without further ado, I, I, Tarana, how are you feeling? Good. I'm a little nervous since I don't know what you're talking to me about. But <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try to keep it nice and slow. But uh, that getting said, so Tarana, you have a very interesting journey, by the way. You spent a lot of time in the US. Mm -hmm. You worked in the US. You went to Colombia. Prior to which you were working for for Morgan Stanley, yeah, uh, and then you worked a couple of a couple more years before, after business school. After business so I did school. ABS, CBS, mortgage backed securities. So I'm wow. I'm responsible or was part. Uh, at, of at least started happened. started the uh, the big short. I yes, <laughs> I interacted with some of the characters. I think I was telling you that. Really? Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I interacted with some of the characters. Greg Lipman being one, very charming. <laughs> <laughs> but that getting said, it's uh, what was it like? To do business school, I think this at the time you did, right? Because not many people from India were, were heading mm -hmm. to those shores at the time. And then India wasn't really, just in the last uh, one of the podcasts we were discussing that India at that time was like what a 300 to 400 billion dollar economy, mm -hmm. not really on the global stage. Uh, and from roughly like a 400 dollar per, per capita GDP, right? And yeah. then you come from that kind of an economy, going to Colombia. And how, how has that been different compared to when you go to the US now? So, you know, to be honest, I i mean, I'd love to give some story that it was, you know, a huge life changing experience. And I, you know, transitioned and I, you know, I, you know, but the fact of the matter is I did grow up in a tier one city in Bombay, even in the 90s. Right. And then I went to boarding school in court, uh, yeah. you know, which was a privileged envi you know, environment, then started my undergrad in the US. So it was not such a culture shock or a change for me. I That's was right. living in New York and working in New York. So from that perspective, it was it was, you know, life as usual, if I have to put it that way. But I was very clear I wanted to do an MBA. Uh, I think from the time I was like maybe eight or nine and I knew the name Harvard Business School. I was very clear. Really? Wow. From that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very, I was very focused. My ambition was literally, and I have to, sometimes I say I should be thanking my, some of my guy friends. Sometimes I think I should be abusing them because until I, I went to boarding school, I was very clear I was doing an engineering degree, going to join my dad in business, take over the family business and manufacturing and run that. Then I go away to Cody, start getting little feelers of Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> the movie Wall Street with Michael yeah. Douglas came out. I have all these boys talking about finance. And so then, of course, when the finance and business route, Today, I think everyone should do an engineering degree. You think like so? most Indian parents. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's very important to have a technical degree. So I think it, the journey started from there that, okay, I was very clear I want to do an MBA, which is why I even stayed back in the US after undergrad. So initially, I thought I'll come back home and join again. You know, like most of us, we think sure, we'll come sure. back and join the family business. But then everyone says, you have to get the right work experience to go to business school. So I think what's changed from, if you ask me, when 
I went there to what India and India being on the map today is today Indian organizations are recognized, right? Going to business school, maybe a little more of a task, but organizations out here, you the names, you'll recognize a Flipkart or a Piramal or a Mahindra or a Tata. Lines, yeah. When we mm. went, you know, it was like, okay, you have to go to one of these tier, sort of do the consulting route or the investment banking route and then go to business school after two years of experience. That was sort of the... Way track that yeah. you did mm -hmm. and way to it and so i followed that path and that's what and interesting enough you know and maybe because we just talked about career paths right yeah. i think many people uh and I'm, I'm personally against it so you could be for it and i'm yeah is that you know they do they finish their engineering degree and immediately go for an mba no work ex in between yeah right and then they finish this you know this entire journey of uh, learning <laughs> yeah Right. And then they have zero work experience and they wonder why they're getting hired for starter rules. Yeah. Right. What is what is your, your view on that? No, I think work experience is key. I do before personally believe MBA. before the MBA. Okay. I think it's it should be. And of course, there are there are exceptions to the rule. But I think having some work ex gives you a perspective in class discussions. Right. Like when I was in business school, one of my classmates was a banker and then he went and worked on an oil refinery. Really? Like wow. literally went and worked on a refinery where he was chugging and getting oil out of <laughs> the sea. So, I mean, you know, it gives you a different perspective. So I think having that is very important. I think that's what I actually value of the US MBA is that, you know, people came with WorkEx, right? It was a that's requirement. True. And you had kids from diverse backgrounds, right? Somebody came from a technical degree. Someone came from marketing. Someone came from, I mean, one of my classmates was a journalist with true. the Washington Post. So I think that sort of gives you a very broad sort of landscape of what is going around. I think here. it also makes a difference because when they're talking about case studies, yeah, right? you're you actually, you've actually seen some of them yeah, in yeah. real life, right? And you're yeah, not just yeah. theoretically talking exactly. about Exactly. You're you able have. to bring a perspective in, which otherwise, as you know, when you've just done learning and come, it's all theory. It's not practice. And what about the other side now? Once you finish business school in the US, mm -hmm. most people would love to come back to India right away. Yeah. Uh, both of us are in the same boat that we spent a lot of time in the U.S. before coming back. Yeah. And we really went through this U.S. experience as as uh, as uh, many should, I believe. Yeah. But w w did that have an impact on you eventually when you uh, came so back? So I think, again, I stayed back because partly I, you know, if you, again, you know, you, you your, your life takes its different yeah. turns, right? When I went to the U.S., my parents didn't think I'd come back. Even though I said, okay, I'm going to come back and join the family business and I want to do this because it's my dad's baby. My parents had sort of assumed this kid of ours is so obsessed with the US, she's not coming back. And after my MBA, I thought, okay, you know, it's good to ha get my green card. So, and I want to get some work experience. I've again done this MBA. I should get some work experience and then move back. So that was the plan. That's a of course, 9-11 hit. Getting a job as a foreigner is not easy. So I stumbled into ABS, CBS, sort of mortgage-backed securities. It was not something I was planning to do. Uh, my intent was, okay, I'm going back to hardcore banking after business school. And uh, and it just so, I remember when I was in business school, a lot of my classmates were like, why do you want to do investment banking? The mm. lifestyle sucks. Why don't you go and do sales and trading? It's a better lifestyle. I'm like, dude, I'm not dealing with people. I'm not a people person. I'm sticking to numbers. Wow. and I'm considering the role you eventually <laughs> <Yeah>. took. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you, that, that's what, and then I was, of course, nine, as I said, 9-11, stumbled into this role. And the first week I was in this role, my boss, really super guy, uh, Greek guy. Actually, I learned a lot from him. He's like, okay, one week in the job, go to the SNP conference. You know, all those conferences and the great, big shot, go. I'm like, go and do what? Go and meet people. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm going to, what am I supposed to do? And it was an experience I learned. I had to handle people. Yeah. I mean, my job at uh, after business school was literally managing people, managing the the traders that we dealt with, the issuers, the mortgage back, the credit committee, and sort of putting the whole package together. I think together. that's the exposure of the US style, right? They just and, throw you into the fire and say, listen, figure this out. Yeah. No, and he world. was a fantastic boss. Like mm. I said, fantastic. Like where you needed help, he was there for you. And then he'd throw you. But for me, that was a learning. One, it, it really got my game up on people skills. But... Two, I think just being in an environment where you sort of had to go and just sort of, I, I wouldn't say adjust, but learn to mold yourself. Right. It changed me as a person. So. And then what was the trigger that got you back to India? So I knew long term I wanted to move back to India. Achha. It was more cultural for me. I think after being in the US and I'm sorry, but seeing kids on the New York subway, 
I was a little scandalized and I was like, okay, I cannot raise kids here. At least at that point, I was like, okay. And long term, I think I value the Indian culture. I think, you know, for all the chaos that we complain about, oh, family interviews, society, so judging and all that, I think I like, I like our culture because it's mm. non, there's no loneliness. People are there for you. Right. I mean, that's a big reason our depression rates are so much lower, the suicide rates are lower in this country, right? So I think I started valuing the Indian sort of family values, the culture. And so that was my primary reason for moving back. And I, again, I was, I was very, I thought I want to come back with a investment bank or mm. an investing role. I came, I met Rakesh Mathur, who is the founder of Webburu, SMS yep. Gupshap today. And he, uh, he made me an offer and I came back in a very sort of non-traditional role of doing biz dev for yeah. Webburu, which meant going to Taiwan to meet OEM manufacturers. So I sort of stumbled into the venture ecosystem. It was not planned. It was- Because after that you went to, you did Sky Advance again as a yeah. senior VP. So to be honest, that uh, all of that was sort of finding my footing after moving back home. I worked at Webber for a year, very early days, was not doing much, quit and then global financial crisis hit and I thought I was going to go back to banking or fi into financial services. There was not much no happening. Jobs, yeah, there, was yeah, there was no jobs, and especially not in India. Yeah, there's, there was so, a chance there were no banks. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I saw the leave in and where. So, so I, uh, a friend of mine who had this thing called Sky Advance, he was doing some deals on a managed basis, got involved there. Parallelly, Mumbai Angels came into form. So I was basically I was dabbling and wasting my time, but it all worked out. Got active with Mumbai Angels. That's how I met you. And then uh, helping a friend with his education venture. He was landscaping the whole education mm. market. This was pre Baiju's on Akan, Akan. This was ever on in Educom days. And from there, so started looking actively at angel investing or rather me these companies and I realized okay I don't have to be a techie because my perception yep. was oh you have to be an engineer to do venture investing that's been the common misconception yeah and I realized you don't have to and uh, so then got active in early stage investing I started enjoying meeting founders learning about interesting ideas and and honestly, it was an eye opener for me in a lot of ways. Again, coming, you know, living in our bubble in Bombay, you think everyone from IIT is a geek. You you don't realize that there's this there's this other world that exists. Like, you know, even when I was at Webberu, there were kids who were grade eight of guitar and piano and did different things. They didn't just study. Like, correct, they weren't correct, just correct. nerds. And so I think it opened a different world to me. And then uh, I ended up at Seed Fund. And then spent An six interesting years. Seed Fund and Mumbai Angels were in the same building. Right? Yes, but that was much later. Mumbai Angels Achha. came there much later, actually. Oh, really? So we were there much before Mumbai Angels came in there. And interestingly enough, because I remember I've seen Seed Fund's portfolio. Yeah, right? yeah. Seed Fund had a very exciting and interesting portfolio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were the, technically, I mean, not not me, but Praveen Gandhi and those guys, uh, the partners there were pioneers, sort of, of yeah, what Seed Fund investing is. They were the first, which is why they, they didn't have to even think of a name, right? And <laughs> they were there fund. for five years. Yes. What was that like? You you were a principal there for five years. You managed and executed multiple transactions. Some of the companies uh, that's also on your LinkedIn profile, Vunik, <laughs> My Dentist, Heckley. Heckel, uh, yeah. And many yeah, yeah. more. Hmm. It, no, it was great. I mean, it was a it was a different era. It was a different, it was truly by sight. <laughs> where, and you had someone like Praveen Gandhi, who was the managing partner. You had people coming to you. I didn't know. It was truly by sight. Founders came to meet us. We would sit there in the conference room and discuss what they were. Not that we were mean or something, but it was truly by sight, right? I didn't know what was going on. And today, I think, investing's become a bit of sell side, right? Where yeah. you're going out. It was more inbound coming in. Uh, it was an interesting era because I think founders, the quality of founders, I'm not going to say that the quality has changed, but the values have changed. The mm. founders we met, they, they were more, they were not so caught up in the valuation game. True. They were truly passionate about what they were building. Today, I feel that's, that's a little skewed. I also think that, that there was nothing called an SHA, right? I mean, whatever you gave was the SHA. I don't think there was a lot of negotiation on... No, no, that still happened. Really? That did. Not as much maybe, but that was or Maybe because I was, I was, you know, Anil used to come between, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in between. So I didn't see it that much. Uh, but I definitely feel that there's a lot more education, but there's a lot more misinformation as well that flows in the ecosystem today compared... Oh, 100%. 100%. I'm telling you, the I mean, like like Vunik, your, so Jayat, we were the first term sheet, so I literally educated him on tag, drag, like pref, all that, right? And, and I saw this founder go from, you know, a company where we gave our first term sheet to at one point being one of the most chased companies with having, you know, Peak 15, which is, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Sequoia, which is now Peak 15, etc. on its cap table but this founder's behavior and demeanor never changed well wow. you know when he was most chased also he was reachable when you know so 
I think th- that sort of value, I don't, I mean, today it's a little mixed bag, I mm. feel, with founders. I think we've also glorified founders into being sort of mini celebrities too early. I mean, that's my personal opinion that, you know, that the the, the game of entrepreneurship or the journey has so many ups and downs. A hundred percent. You know, and, and rat or rat, like it, yeah, yeah. overnight you can find your business gone. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think uh, before I th- someone's truly successful, we sort of glorify them into 30 under 30, 40 under 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gone completely. And I think it has, I think, unfortunately, like you said, it's become a, you know, instead of just focusing on the business, focusing on what, let them, let them focus on what they Correct. build. We get caught up in all the sort of optics, you know, of what's going on around us. And I don't know if partly blame social media and LinkedIn and partly, Twitter, I mean, uh, or are, is it just uh, PR? I, I, I don't know who to blame for that. Uh, it used to be so difficult to get space in a newspaper in 2012, even if you did a two crore <laughs> round. Today's, you know, today newspaper, like, if it's less than one million, <laughs> you, don't, you don't even, like, it's not happening. Right? No, I, I, we, when uh, Seed Fund uh, did the exit for Red Bus, 800 crores, it was big news. Absolutely, it wow. Was, what was, was that like? The Because, you know, until then, and uh, unfortunately, maybe because we get clubbed with private equity at most times, mm-hmm. uh, VC has always been looked at, oh, you know, this... PVC, PVC yeah. is sub teen returns, yeah. but I don't think that is the case when it comes really to VC, VC, pure VC, right? And how how was that like to finally go? Listen, here is a company we exited yeah. and made all this money. It was, I mean, it was because Seed Fund has a fantastic DPI from what I remember. It was a, yeah. it was a really uh, significant number and meaningful. Were and you involved in a lot of the investments or a lot of the divestments after you joined? So. Uh, I was involved in some investments and then not too much on the divestments because other than Red Bus Karwali, we didn't have too many. We had a few small ones, but uh-huh. you know, yeah. So it wasn't a function if I have to, I can't take credit for that. Okay. So um, I think Praveen Gandhi was the key driver in, in a way since he was and a, it's a great manager. name, Seed Fund. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm saying no, we didn't, we didn't, we, 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 was, we didn't have to come up with a name. <laughs> It I, just flowed naturally. Yeah, I, I think this was around the time even Morpheus was a, was a big thing back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then, you know, you went on to join Innovent Capital. Mm-hmm. And now that's a big switch. You go from a seed fund to now saying, I'm going to start doing venture debt, mm-hmm. right? Completely on the other side. In 2017, I mean, debt to startups was not an unknown thing. Forget about venture debt. Just ka naam kisne suna nahi tha us tak. Yeah. What was the, you know, big switch that happened over there? The honest answer is, uh, Seed Fund was not raising the next fund. Achha. And uh, I was pretty clear by then that I wanted to be in the ecosystem because I genuinely, and, and even today I do enjoy meeting founders and learning what they're building. And honestly, if I had a great idea, I would go out and do something, but I don't. So what's the next best thing I can do is I can piggyback off these founders and my claim can claim to be like I'm involved with them as a early stage investor, angel investor or giving them debt. So so Seed Fund was not raising another fund. Uh, it was not easy or there weren't too many opportunities to make the lateral move to other equity funds. And uh, so I stumbled upon an opportunity at Innovent. And uh, so, and you su- you started out as a senior director, yes, right, and and uh, but how like what director? What, what, I think not senior director. I don't remember now, but <laughs> I just want to be clear <laughs> in case. But that getting said, you know, uh, Tarana, it was how would you explain to someone what venture debt was in 2017? Even today, I don't think many people understand. But in 2017, when most people were still trying to understand what venture capital is, you were talking yes. about venture debt. Yeah. Right, which is like, and and to many, right, and I, I maybe present company included, it was like, how do you trust the balance sheets oh. that 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 they can even manage this kind of debt, even if it is one crore, how yeah. are they going to pay it back? These are inherently uh, loss making businesses. For, yeah. Sorry, so for I the, think yeah. venture debt. Um, it was a little bit of a mind shift change that I had to make because on the equity side, and especially early stage equity, you know, you are. It's a zero hundred. You're Correct. betting that this thing is going to go to hundred. You're not. You're not betting for a ten or twenty or either. You're right. Or even like, okay, let me get my capital back. It's like all or nothing. Two, I think when you go into when you're on the equity side, it's a lot more strategic long term with hmm. the founder and the company. You're, you're literally married to it. On the debt side, you're thinking it's a little more thinking. Okay, zero to will this company be around for the next five years? Because my okay. debt needs to be paid back. And will my debt be paid back in the next? Because our tenor of the loan is anywhere from 18 months to 36 months. So that's my first sort of train of thought that I have to make that, okay, is this, will I get my capital back, True. my debt back? Two, 
I mean, at least on the early stage side and not so much for growth, you forget what a balance sheet is. I mean, I remember there were companies even in our portfolio at Seed Fund where actually they were not burning that much on the PNL, but they had working capital cycles where the cash was going and we were missing that as investors at times. And I, even though I did accounting in undergrad and had done banking, <laughs> I had forgotten what a balance sheet was. So I think that was the other piece that I had to sort of go back so and... So critical though, right? I think yeah. I think over a period of time, and I, I think maybe over the last three or four years, more so, is you start to understand what working capital, how difficult important. and important... Yeah. I mean, how difficult it is for a business... To manage. To manage. And secondly, how important it is, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Because you can have fantastic, like you said, fantastic PL yeah. numbers. and But then you start scratching through the numbers and realizing, oh, operating cash is still negative. Yeah. Because you're not getting paid on time. You're not getting paid. Finance 101 cash is king. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, so, so yeah. So I think that was the second sort of reminder. And uh, and the way to look at venture debt is not that it's a, it's a replacement for equity. Companies still have to raise equity. It is more like a top up to your equity round. Hmm. So a lot of the startups unfortunately, will not get bank debt because they're not profitable. They don't have hard assets. Banks don't know how to underwrite them. So they say, okay, we cannot give these companies debt. But if it's a brick and mortar business or a, you know, a business that has a working capital requirement, seems like a waste that you use equity money True. for it, which is where venture debt plays a role. So we're sort of, okay, what we say is, and, but we're not a bridge loan either. We're not something where we'll come in with a company with four months runway and say, okay, between two equity rounds, let me raise some debt. It, it is basically, it's more to be used as a top up to equity round where it helps the founders and other stakeholders like small funds like us not to dilute, right? right. Or dilute less because it says, okay, let's use this debt money. We have equity. We'll be operational for the next year, 18 months. Let's raise some debt to either accelerate our growth or if we have this working capital or CapEx requirement where we can use it. So You said a very key word, which I think most founders need to understand. You said underwrite. <laughs> Right. And and I don't think many founders mm -hmm. understand what underwriting is, Fair especially right. from a debt perspective. Right? So when we underwrite, so as equity guys, you're underwriting the business, your the business model, the yeah. vision, how big is the TAM? And we're doing all that as well. But there I'm piggybacking a lot on the equity guys. What we follow very closely is the cash flows, the mm. ideally month on month cash flows, because I want to see that this company knows that it's going to be around for the next year or 18 months where they're managed to sort of build this business and that they'll be have the, they'll have the ability to raise the next round of equity because right. the longer they stay around that's the way they'll repay my debt because ultimately I'm debt I have to be paid back that's true and that's that's the important part right yeah. that you have to be paid back the venture capital guys can write it yeah <laughs> they can write off things and because you know they they, they have their moonshots right yeah. they, they, if in a venture capital portfolio out of 10 or 20 companies, you, even if you have one that takes off with 100x, it's yeah, literally yeah. going to pay everything, everything else off. off. But here, that doesn't happen. You're never going to get, because even if the company, and that's the benefit and <laughs> maybe, you know, the 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 curse of venture debt is that <laughs> on the on at least for the founder, you can pay back this money and you're done, right? Yeah. And that dilution is saved. Yeah. But at the same time, if you don't pay back this money, right, then they can exercise because the debt guy gets paid first on anything. Yes. And for you, you have to make sure. That's why you were saying underwriting. And that they pay you, you know, back. We, I mean, make sure and all that. Ultimately, we're all part of the ecosystem. We do try to work with our founders when things are tough. So we're not loan sharks either. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should be at times, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's balancing. Ultimately, everyone has to coexist. Where I think founders need to realize is that this is debt. It needs to be repaid. And so they have to think about it responsibly. And even my peers, and including us, we're guilty sometimes. We do push debt on companies when they shouldn't be taking debt. Mm. And I think that's what everyone needs to sort of recognize. When should the company raise debt? How much debt? Sometimes we get carried away. And I understand founders sometimes are desperate for capital. But I think they need to recognize that I need to fund this with equity or I need to fund it with debt. And I also think sometimes... And I've heard this before, simply or maybe 12 months ago when, when mm -hmm. money was flowing so quickly and so fast, thick and fast, that uh, most of the founders started treating venture debt also as venture capital. Yes. Right. As yeah. though that, you know, they could also put that money to work in very long term projects or very long term expenses or even towards marketing and yeah. branding, which is going to take a long time to pay back. Yeah. Far before that, you need to be paid back as well. Some did. I won't say a lot. And this was, I, I don't think, again, this was even just the market dynamics. I think this was just everyone just the gold rush, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, capital was cheap. 
And so everyone was sort of and there's being a, irresponsible, and there is a including big us, including us capital hmm. providers on the equity or debt side. And there's a key difference between venture uh, or debt from a bank mm -hmm. and venture debt from a fund. Yeah. Because you're looking for a kicker. Right? That's a Wait, difference. There are a couple of key differences. One, banks definitely put more stringent covenants hmm. and bank debt cannot be used for acquisitions. Venture debt can. Achha. So that's one big advantage to our... And because we put less stringent covenants, and we understand, right, unlike, and it's not a bank's fault, banks' risk appetite's different. They are answerable to a lot more people, and they're a bigger organization. Now, tomorrow, if a founder's breaching a covenant, who's he going to reach at the bank? And who's going to make the decision to say, okay, we'll wave off this covenant? At, you know, when they can reach out to me and say, okay, you know what, Tan, I'm raising money, but this month my debt to equity may be a little off, or my cash balance is a little off. We'll work with you. We understand, okay, you know, it's... It's an early you, stage you company. You won't report that as an NPA or something. Yeah, yeah, it's an early stage company, right? We understand things are moving, things, you know, we, we're more flexible. So we're slightly more expensive than a bank, but you're paying for the convenience and flexibility. But as I said, no, we don't usually put stringent covenants. We work with you. You can use us for acquisitions. But the equity kicker piece is, is not really, I mean, sometimes even banks take it, I think. But generally, it is what we we hope will make up for the sort of the risk we're taking. Achha. So that's what it is. So the loan is a plain vanilla loan with a coupon. We do working cap lines as well with a coupon. And then we have this equity kicker, which is ten generally 10% of the loan amount. So the way founders need to look at it is, like if they took a million dollars, you know, what they would be diluting for the same million dollars versus 100K for that equity kicker. So it's significantly almost one-tenth. And so so when, when a founder approaches you, and imagine mm. there is a founder listening in today, thinks that, you know, <laughs> I think I'm ready for venture debt. Right. Mm. And so I'm going to reach out to Tarana. What are the five questions they should be prepared for in the first meeting that you are definitely going to ask them? <laughs> okay. Wow, you make me sound... Well, it's, it's first of all, I wish I was... Uh, we, we're not, again, as I said, we're not uh, interrogating them. It's a partnership. Yeah. So one, I want to understand the business. What are you building? So similar to the equity guy, what are you building? Quality of founder? What sort of, you know, where are you in terms of other competitors? How big is this market? So understanding broadly the business. Where I dig deeper a little bit is to understand, okay, are you coming to me as a bridge loan? Or, I mean, do you have three months runway, 12 months runway? So that's one of the key factors. Then who are your equity investors? Because I do piggyback on them for a governance for their DD because we don't do extensive DD. We sort of rely on the uh, equity investors that they've done their homework. So who are the investors, sort of who's on the board, what, you know, is there governance? I mean, tomorrow they take my money and vanish, I'm in big <laughs> trouble, right? So that's sort of the second tier. And then third, we then start underwriting the business. So those are the, I would say there are three questions. One, what are you building? And um, similar to an equity come, guy yeah. and the sub questions, how much runway do you have? Because I, I do, it's irresponsible. If I give a company that has three months money in the bank, I'm accelerating their debt instead of helping them. Correct. Because if things don't go right, they've just incrementally taken on this liability, which was not needed. And, th go ahead. and three, just looking at, is there an institutional equity investor in there? Because I need that from a governance and DD perspective. And when we were speaking earlier hmm. to this point, you said there's also a sweet spot of when the founders should reach out to you. Because the common misconception again is to reach out to a venture debt fund right when you're raising venture capital. Or like a C if you're raising yeah. a series A, reach out to Innoven at the same time. But when we spoke a little earlier, you said, listen, wait two, three months after the round is complete so, and then reach out to us. Well, I wouldn't say wait two, three months. I think it's about how much runway do you have. Hmm. Now, if you have 12 months runway, you should take it with the equity round. But if you have 30 months runway, then wait three to six months. I see. And then also it depends on what tenor you want. What is the use of the debt? You know, is it working What do you capital? think should be the use of the debt? So, I mean, again, the use generally, I mean, for working capital, capex and acquisitions, it's a no-brainer. Why use equity money? But there can be cases where a company, for example, the founder wants to raise 5 million because mm. he wants to go into, say, three geographies and he believes that's when his risk return profile of the company changes. But he's getting interest for four or he's getting interest for five, but the valuation is not what he likes. So then maybe raise that incremental one, one and a half million in debt with the equity round or a couple of months before or after, start the conversations and then you can raise it. Where I say the companies, you know, you don't have to raise it with equities. If you have, you're, ra you, you're raising money and you have 36 or 30 months of money in the bank, I mean, N not don't the, take it. And for this, all my peers are going to come and kill me. You better <laughs> not put this in. <laughs> now the, and, uh, the question there being, does raising debt from you, 
because I think your uh, Innovin is initially an NBFC. Mm-hmm. Does it also raise the credit profile for the company? It can help them with discipline. So okay. again, we were an NBFC, now we're an AIF fund okay, structure. Though we still have the NBFC vehicle, but yes, starting to take debt from any one of us helps build your credit history, right? Similar. So it okay. brings dis- So it does bring a lot of discipline into companies as well, irrespective of the vehicle. Plus, it does give you credit history. So those are sort of the two advantages. And I've noticed that most venture debt funds, and I'm not, I'm sort of generalizing here, have also started a, some sort of a venture capital business also on the side. A couple have, of folks, we haven't, no. And I don't think we will. Why Why would you not do it? I think two things. One, I mean, there's enough to do in the debt pay, piece. And then two, I mean, it might create a little bit of, today we work with our capital equity investors as partners. Hmm. Wouldn't be so great to have them perceive us as competitor, True. right? So I think it it's a little it's a little tricky. I'm not saying it may never happen, but uh, I mean I don't know. We love it because I still think the equity has its own. Uh, and we're going to come to come to your own angel investment journey, <laughs> which is very very interesting. But cu- coming back to the venture debt, which was the which was the first deal that you did in venture debt? So the first deal I did was Porter. Porter. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I, very I, proud of it. <laughs> and and. And uh, like, what what was that journey like? Was 2017 like trying to yeah. explain that to somebody? So you know, it was it was in. I mean, that they were they were looking for it. They were in the midst of closing an equity round, and so they wanted to raise some money. So another use case, and I'm not saying this is ideal, is a lot of times founders want to go from a position of strength when they're negotiating. Hmm. So to have more cash in the bank, where you have more runway, then it gives you more time to sort of negotiate your next equity fundraise you know, call it extension of runway, call it going from a position of strength. And that's where, you know, Porter raised some money so they could go from a position of strength where they were negotiating for a trans uh, for their next Series B. And that's where we played a role. And so we explained to them what the pros and cons of, of course, venture data, you know, gave the pitch on, hey, you know, you can dilute less and this helps you sort of, you know, keep the momentum going. And it does, right? Tomorrow, if you're able to show a little more growth or traction, as I said, changes the risk profile, you can even get a higher valuation. So there are companies in our portfolio that have raised loan eight and nine. Okay. And you can see that- From from you? Yeah, from us. Oh, wow. And just from us. And now there I'm- Bring PR for Innovin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's worked out for them where over the life of these eight, nine loans that they've raised, the, the founders and stakeholders have actually saved a bit on dilution and equity. Hmm. So, And usually your LPs would, because you know, this was an mm-hmm. NBFC. So I'm guessing most of the LPs would have been family offices. So and- in the NBFC, we had just two LPs, which was Temasek and UOB of Singapore. Wow. Okay. So that was so the history of Innoven is it was Silicon Valley Bank mm-hmm. and then in 15th Amasek and UOB acquired the business or the book. So you worked with Ajay at some it point as Innoven. Or? I never worked with Ajay. I Achha. joined after he left. Achha. Yeah. He's, he was one of our very early guests in the Money Talks, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I I mean, if you're, I'm used to see him. I, you know, so I knew Ajay a little bit at, because of Mumbai Angels That's again. That's true. Yeah. That's true. And so you were saying that, okay, so you mm-hmm. you so you, you only had two LPs. Yeah. So in the okay. NBFC, it was Temasek and UOB. And it was sort of, they were the stakeholders. Now we have an AI fund structure, 200 million. Of, and there we have family offices and a bunch of HNIs and founders in the ecosystem as well. So that's a huge validation that they came in. And I think I have, very, I have a very interesting question because we mm-hmm. spoke a lot about returns in the previous podcast as well. Uh, one of the concerns that always happens in the mm-hmm. Indian ecosystem is that we have this thing that Main khud kar lunga. Mm-hmm. I can do it myself. Why do I need you? Right. And, and in many ways in debt, mm-hmm. because many people have been giving debt randomly for a while. Mm-hmm. That they have the feeling that, oh, I can go to a real estate guy and I can get 2% per month. I've heard all these stories, right? Uh, how do you... How do you justify saying that, listen, I don't think you can really you know, make money in this asset class mm-hmm. by going to a mutual fund or going somewhere else? You can't do this direct. You need someone professional. For venture debt? For venture debt. So I think it's a, venture debt is a bit, it's a lot about relationship. Mm. It's a lot about relationship. It's a lot about understanding the businesses. And again, similar to any sort of asset class, it's a lot about the portfolio approach. Right. So between those three, I think you, it's ideal if you... I mean, I'm, again, get someone to manage, manage it. it. No, I, yeah. I, I completely agree. And a with lot it. of it is about, I think, getting insight and relationship and building that comfort, right? It's also, and not just from, okay, that Tarana may have some insights of who to put money in and she's smart, but also from a founder and a, uh, the capital equity providers who we partner with, them feeling comfort that, okay, you know, we can work with Tarana because it's debt. Again, you have to understand when things are not going right at these startups, you need to have a trust factor. Correct. And is is it 
a known or an unknown who I can work with that, okay, if things are not going right, is she going to, or he work with me? I also me? feel, it, is, is it easy to build a portfolio? Like your, I, I, I just listed your portfolio, uh, mm. you know, I was, in, in, in my document here, it took me two pages to finish it. Yeah, yeah, right? And so huge. there was a very much portfolio approach here. And I don't know if anybody can do that yeah, kind yeah. of a portfolio with the kind of hand-holding or a kind of deep in-depth uh, analysis without having a proper team. Yeah, you need a team. No, no, and as I said, a lot of it is about picking up the chatter, understanding things, right? You, uh, in venture debt, you are wearing an equity hat with mm. debt. So unless you think you have such insights, and I'm not saying people don't, there are individuals who do and they, they should. There are people who are smarter that if you have such insights to do venture equity deals, then maybe you take a chance with debt. But I'm guessing but nobody can write a small check into venture debt, right? It has to be substantial enough for someone to Meaningful. Someone yeah. Meaningful. I mean, you can start small, but I think the other thing to keep in mind, again, like I said, is an equity and debt, there's a different hat. One mm. is zero to 100. You, am I willing to take that risk? With debt, you have to think, okay, recovery of capital. That's true. So, you know, you have to sort of balance that out as a individual as well when you're considering it. So something, you know, sometimes what people miss is you're probably taking equity risk for debt-like returns. Yeah. If you're giving debt to a very early company because you think, oh, I know it all. And it could work out. It's a gamble. But just keep that in mind. Also, you and you talked about this, uh, you know, even before when we were sitting, uh, having lunch, that uh, it's also very important to have the discipline to exit. <laughs> Because yes. remember, you're also holding on to warrants of yeah, these yeah, of yeah. these companies, and and many of these companies. I mean, you have great markets to exit, and then suddenly you're not <laughs> exiting because the IRR looks amazing. But if you don't exit, it could affect your overall IRR. Oh, 100 percent. So I've come to the conclusion, though I'm a big fan of Pollock and all these Warren Buffett, and feel like yeah, stay in forever. It's I'm all, right now. I am playing with other people's money or investing other people's money. Mm -hmm. That's a responsibility. So I think you have to, you have to be willing to also leave money on the table because I, I think you can't be greedy. I remember Praveen Gandhi used to say this at Seed Fund. How, and I, I mean, my dad says it, that everyone has to make money up the value Correct. chain. And, you know, we were an early stage fund. If I didn't leave money on the table for someone else, then the growth investors aren't going to come in. The growth mm -hmm. investors only going to come in because he thinks that, oh, hedge fund or a public but, markets guy will come in. The public markets guy is going to come in if he thinks this can be listed. So you have to, everyone has to leave something on the table. You have to make it a win-win. And so that's my sort of one philosophy. And two, I am, as I said, it's other people's money. Who am I to decide and just keep it there forever? You know, giving them something back, just, you know, at least giving their capital back Let's me sleep it's, it's at always, night. Yeah, exactly. At least the so, capital principle needs to go back first. So in our model, so as I said, you know, of course, as debt, I give the capital, uh, the, the debt back as the term loan comes back to me and that gets repaid to our investors after year four because we do recycle the money and after year four, they start getting principal repayments. But on the warrants, I mean, at some point, you just have to say, you know what, this is the time to get out. I have made whatever a few you know, times return on it. And now it's time to get out. And, you know, it's it's a mix of, you know, your relationship with the founders, what's doing right by the company, but also just saying, okay, you know what, let's get out and let's give this capital gains back to our LPs. And, what's and the, we've been lucky, touch wood. Now, I don't know you when. had two large institutions in effectively fund one, you could call it. I mean, yeah. It was an NDFC. And, yeah. and now you're obviously raising, or you've raised money from family offices. And and, and in, they came in as well as uh, they significant did. investors. But what is the difference in mindset now compared to, let's say, you know, because institutions like <laughs> Temasek, you will be already in the lending business. So they, they may understand <laughs> the challenges and the opportunities a lot better. than. So let's we say, do have a little more hand-holding with our I LPs. See. Hmm. Personally, I feel a lot more responsible because I'm feeling here there are people who I, who are individuals who've come in maybe on my relationship. And so I feel a lot more responsible that God, please, I cannot lose anyone's <laughs> money. <laughs> so I'm like, so I feel more of an onus that I have to do the, do the right thing. Meanwhile, and I'm hoping we can give them the best returns. I think definitely debt is a place uh, where discipline trumps everything, right? And yes. having, having uh, you know, even if there is, because, you know, in equity, you might say, okay, if out of 10 things, as long as I'm okay with seven, we're going to make it happen. Yeah. Right? We'll figure out the three as yeah. we go along. In debt, unfortunately, there's no figuring out, right? So because you Again, can go eight, yeah, eight, nine, eight, nine, but you can't go, you, you can't, can't go, go six, you can't yeah. go five, six, yeah. but you do have to take a little bit of a gut chance yeah. at times because it is ventured, it, hence the word venture in there, right? Correct. I'm saying, but uh, yeah. it's a very, very little chances yeah. you can take. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. As I talking. said, mortality, you, as much as possible, you have to manage your mortality. Because remember, the, unlike 
and and that that's what founders should remember that unlike let's say if you became a billion dollar startup and then your valuation drops to uh 50 million yeah. right well the equity guys are all going to get squished into that 50 million the debt guy is not getting squished in anywhere yeah. right so and that's the point that needs to be remembered at all time and i'm only say, saying this because you're the first second venture debt person i've had mm -hmm. uh, after after ajay mm -hmm. and i've always felt that you know that founders need to be extremely careful and respectful of debt right equity you should be respectful too but but this is a different kind of respect you have to make sure that you pay them back Yes, you do. I think, but that's where I think we and the founders need to work together yeah. to understand what is the what level of debt should the company be taking, Correct. and yeah. what is the requirement. And err on the side of caution. I think yes. if you can take five crores less, less, and I know it's against the business for me to say that, but take five crores less, and maybe in the next go around, go a little larger. Yeah. Because uh, and like you said, I think the debt is also very habit form. It needs to be habit forming. Uh, you know, if your first check itself is a hundred crore and you've never managed debt, you don't have a CFO, you don't know how the cash flows are going to go yeah. work. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen companies in my portfolio and outside, not mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. startups but listed as well, uh, sort of go crazy with debt. Of course, right? Because mm -hmm. it's so easy, yeah. right? That's uh, why there's a what what was it in business school or in finance that whole right optimal leverage structure, correct? And mm -hmm. Things like so. And uh, so so now. Uh, let me let's mm -hmm. talk about your own personal angel investment journey okay. right so i think you've been investing personally as well some of the companies mm -hmm. i could find and somehow you've kept yourself very unknown in the market <laughs> i don't know how you did it but if you could if you could share some secrets i'd like to erase no, some no. of the <laughs> 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 but uh, so tarana you also write personal checks right small checks so, small, checks. small checks uh, and so you've done i think groyo jiffy slick Mm -hmm. Allo Health are the four that that is publicly known. Mm -hmm. What are the ones that are not listed here? So there are a bunch of them. There's uh, Master Chow. There's Zemi, which mm -hmm. is a hair care skin product. There's Bold Care. There's Genwise. There's DSLR. Uh, there's Convin. There's Fixcraft. What else? Uh, SpaceX, I think. SpaceX and uh, Stripe were sort of later stage deals that I did uh, in the US. So I don't know if I'd call them angel or just you know venture. be able to just maybe the say, venture category yeah, yeah venture category that I was able to stake my claim on. Um, I can't think, but those are broadly the ones that I've done. I know I've done totally like twenty one. I can't. So and, when you uh, when you're now wearing this hat of a venture capital investor, mm -hmm. what are the what are sort sort of the questions you're getting? Are the questions the same or are they a bit different? No. So as an angel investor, I think the key thing that you bet on is always as like similar to an early stage investor is the quality of founder, right? Mm. The founder and the opportunity. And if you believe the founder is good, you figure you you assume he will. Or she will make it an opportunity. So I think those are the two key things. And then because I'm a small angel investor, I sort of see what check size they're. I mean, overall what they're raising and what my contribution is. So, I mean, of course there are exceptions always. But am I going to come into a company that's raising, say, fifty lakhs? No, because I don't know what my money will do for Correct. them. Right? They're so early. I think that's when a founder should be raising, either putting his own, him or her, putting their own money in, or friends and family. Right? Because my money may not make or break anything. If they're going and raising twenty million, what is my small check going mm. to do, and what is the valuation there? What val and what value can I bring? So I ideally also see where sort of you know ideally in that you know where they're raising that maybe two to five million dollar check size where I can add value. There's I can get some stake that could go somewhere, and I can more importantly where I can add some value with the founder, right? I mean I'm partly doing it also to sort of intellectually challenge myself that okay can i help him beat with strategy i mean business strategy business development not strategy as much i think business development or partnerships or help with hiring or fundraising something so that's sort of how i broadly categorize you know that okay and what sort of help are you providing besides the money so you know sometimes it's just connecting them to folks relevant folks given you know i have a decent network or funds given mm. again the relationship and i believe in, even on the venture debt side one of the things i've heard of that course. the venture debt investors definitely connect you with other, yeah, yeah 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 it's i mean see I, as i said right in the beginning the reason mm. i sort of moved also from equity to debt and it was very clear i want to be in this ecosystem and one thing that i enjoy is working with the founders mm. a lot and i think you have to ultimately i think in the any any ecosystem playing it forward and being able to just do whatever you can is is a huge boon right you should just do it in, uh, in the time without... you've been in the ecosystem though and you've been in the ecosystem a mm -hmm. few years longer than me many funds have come and gone right and you were mm -hmm. part of a 
I, I think was a great brand. Seed yeah, Fund. Yeah, of course. You were yeah. part of MA very early as well. You were also venture advisor to uh, Aureolus. And, yeah, and as well as still. a venture partner for K. Yeah. Right? You've seen started. all of these brands come and go. And Some many of these are still, still here. Yeah. I'm just saying that these, yeah. there are brands that have come and go, but but mm. so many that I'm naming that have yeah. disappeared. What what do you think, you know, places like K Capital, you know, when you know mm. these these brands have been around now for over a decade. Yeah. What are they doing different that the other fund managers have not? And I'll I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking you this question. Yeah. Many in the last five years at least, or mm. last three years more specifically, Many family offices have mm. decided to become fund managers. Yeah. Right? They've taken one fa- member, member from the family. They said, okay, this mm. person is going to become the fund manager. I don't think the mindset is the same as that who, of somebody who professionally wants to run a fund. Right? And, and like you said, the responsibility is completely different. Of course. Because, right? I mean, family office having your own money and what risks you can take versus what, I mean, when you have other people's money, the Absolutely. onus you feel, right? Um, I think what what's worked or hasn't worked, I think one is just sort of building the right team. Hmm. You know, you have to sort of start thinking as an organization and a partnership. What happens with a lot of funds is I think it's a one man show. Absolutely. And I think you have to sort of think, okay, how do I build an organization? How do I build, I mean, similar to an on, ongoing concern sort of, you know, where I hire the right folks or I get the right folks in right. who are just as motivated, who believe that we're all working, you know, and they think of it as their own. So I think that's one thing that I think uh, works or doesn't work. And two, a little bit of discipline, even on the equity side, right? You need a little bit of discipline and uh, on just how you sort of build your, you know, staying focused. Correct. Maybe it's to your investment stage or the sectors that you're focusing on. I think we're talking about size of fund, yeah. right? Size so of important. fund, yeah. Because that does, that can sometimes get you, you may be a great early stage investor, but it's tough to then give, mimic that in, you know, in a growth stage. Correct. Or, or, or give those returns. Larger fund size. Yeah, larger fund size. Maybe a great size, investor so. with a 300 crore fund size. Yeah, exactly. You grow that 3,000 crore, suddenly you can't you multiply at the same price. Yeah. At the same so place. I think that sort of then doesn't, and you have to just, again, I think it's all about sort of, also just doing things the right way. I think you're having goodwill in the ecosystem can take can take you a long way, you know? So let, let, maybe mm. as you look forward, right? Mm. What emerging trends do you see in venture debt? Do you like what? Because, okay, mm. you can fund businesses that have working capital cycles, stuff like that. Now space tech is becoming big. Yeah. Right? And we've discussed a couple yeah. of my space tech ventures. You're invested in one as well. Yeah. Uh, that, is that is that a good venture to back for venture debt? So not when they're in R and D. Okay, very important. I want to <laughs> but, make sure that I bring but, this up. But, but I'm sure we will all do it, including probably us at some point. If, <laughs> unfortunately, or fortunately, some companies, if a, if a space tech company or a manufacturing company in R and D has raised fifty million and they come to me for ten, I might just do it. <laughs> <laughs> right or wrong? I mean, it comes down to what they're using yeah. it for and all. Uh, you know, maybe for capex, it makes sense, right? But I would say when they've sort of started to reach production, why not? Yeah. I mean, at that point, it's a no-brainer. They should then be building the business with debt, right? Why would you use equity money uh, for capex? And the reason why I asked that is also it's not yeah. just I, mean, I, not I space use space tech. tech any of the manufacturing yeah. that we were or even discussing. deep tech, right? Yeah. I mean, if you are still on R and D, there is and you have a long yeah, road. Because R and D is a long gestation, and plus you don't know the, what the success rate Correct. is going to be. I think the minute you have some clarity of what sort of the probability is, then it that's the time to approach, sense, right? Yes. Okay. And I think what are some of the untapped markets or sectors you believe that venture debt could revolutionize in the next? I don't know about venture debt revolution because. Let's be honest again. We are a derivative of equity. We will okay. follow where the equity guys go. So would that's you, the truth. Would you give debt to Chat GPT? Would I give model debt? in India? Of course, I would. If they gave, if someone gave them equity money, right or wrong, I would give them some money. <laughs> I think where we we are uh, we are a little more uh, cautious is jokes aside is on the AI or the Chat GPT where we would want to understand a little bit on the regulatory aspect. Because I would not want to take that regulatory risk that an equity guy may be comfortable taking on sort of how this works out. And it's similar with biotech or any of these because we don't have the knowledge. I don't have the expertise to sort of how do I sort of underwrite these again. And how big is team size now at uh, Innovin? So we're 16 of us. 16 of us. So it's a pretty lean team. mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, Tarana, I think this was a great conversation, especially from understanding venture debt. I hope so. Uh, yeah, and from you. a journey perspective, I think a very interesting <laughs> career where you've been, you know, you, you had your uh, uh, your journey in the US, 
then the mid level management or mid level to senior level management roles that you did mm-hmm. between 6 and 12 and then from there the whole venture journey yeah. and and so what does tarana look like 10 years from now let's say we have another podcast <laughs> what would you would what would you would what would you have had to have done in the next 10 years and you would say you know what it, life worked like, out life worked out uh i would say professionally i should have i mean made enough money if i have to, even more you got two diamond studs in your ear you can have that but i have a capitalist at the end of it so you know that number has moved in fact it's actually come down most people the number goes up in my case it's come down because i feel i have less responsibilities mm-hmm. on the personal front so i think just enough where i feel i have the flexibility of my time mm. you know i'd ideally like to travel more okay and but i'd still like to continue being part of the ecosystem and maybe at that point more on a sort of helping companies without having to think that i have to make something out of it mm-hmm. and doing investing maybe an accelerator whatever but just doing sort of more pro bono would be ideal okay at that point you're also independent directors in a couple of, i mean yeah I, Yeah, uh, you've taken those kind of roles as well. Yes, so right. I'd love to do a lot more of that because I think it's a great learning. So I think ultimately, I'd want to know that even at ten years down the road, I am intellectually challenged and okay. learning something. That's a very, very noble goal to no, have. No, no, it's not a noble goal. It's just I feel like I need because to I, I know that you, you have uh, an incredible, you know, ability to also do some of these extracurricular activities that we might take for granted. Like I know you swim. Almost <laughs> like because I can eat chocolate every day because I, I don't have discipline. <laughs> But I've seen you run at Marine Drive, right? Even during I think even the COVID years, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You you and you were so focused. I'd be like, hey, Tarana, and you're like, <laughs> she didn't even. Say. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah. But but. So how important are those extracurricular activities because you know our roles are very stressful yeah. let's be honest oh But very so so i'm almost ocd about exercising and okay. i'm i'm very shallow so i like i think it's important to look decent and mm-hmm. good so i do it purely for superficial reasons But it's so, so not, nothing. Oh, there's no big story over here that you know. I need to get my men. <laughs> no, no, no. no I'm, it's very simple. I like eating chocolate, but I'm so judgmental that I can't be fat. So then I say, okay, I have to eat and delete it. So fantastic. Uh, so Tarana, thank you so much. I think this journey <laughs> yeah. through, uh, and thank you so much for being candid about the journey. And also, I think in many ways, maybe when I. when i had ajay on the on on the show venture debt even for me was a very new asset class and i was still yeah. trying to understand it in 2020 mm-hmm. uh, today it's obviously a w- much more better known it's m- much more accepted there's a lot more awareness yeah. and i think the fund sure. sizes have also like you know you know yeah. you're hearing like 200 million 250 mm-hmm. million yeah. you know, 3000 crore funds being raised yeah. so it's getting to become a much more uh, mainstream mainstream provider. asset class yeah. uh, that's coming up so uh, as a next section mm-hmm. right in in the money talks and we end with this is mm-hmm. always a rapid fire round okay right so So, so there's no hamper though by the way so oh. if, if there's any hamper expectations we'll get, we can we can we can find sponsors who can give them to you <laughs> okay done but uh, from the, but from uh, the artha portfolio uh, yeah i oh, actually like we should have put to, can we can we do this we should put together a a Yeah, a hamper of artha goodies All right let's do that okay so good that's it thank you so much when you come back uh, 10 year no 10 years 30 30 episode i'll do it 10 years <laughs> no no we'll hamper. send you this for this episode <laughs> we'll send it to you but by the time we, we we'll credit that to this particular moment done but that being said Shalom. rapid fire is very quick i'm going to ask you a question whatever first comes to mind just okay blurt it out and and if we find something interesting we'll just get a little bit okay. deeper into it sure so first question uh what's the first action you undertake after waking up swimming I no, get the up. first thing as soon as you wake up what's what's like some people oh check God, their check phone check my phone check horrible phone. check my phone myth or reality mm-hmm. work life balance is possible a uh, reality it's possible yeah it's so possible. far you're the first person who's ever said that to me no it's possible i think it's possible so how how do you achieve it if if you could You know I ha- I'm insomnia so that's how because I don't sleep much I'm able to achieve it. Oh so there there you go that you have a secret hack. I don't know if it's a ha- good or bad hack but yeah that's uh, Who's your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero or Superman? Superman. Yeah. Most people say Batman right? Yeah. No. But you, I thought you were saying Superwoman. No Superman. <laughs> I'm not politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> One question you wish investors would ask more often. I think uh founders ask who? No, like you as an investor getting asked from other investors like people that are investing in you do a total ref check on me hmm. personally professionally all aspects of the individual to know their character and what about the other way so you you wish that people would ask more of founders same i think you know we we need to not separate between someone's professional and personal character 
and we tend to do that but it's so difficult in the angel world right i mean and may and I'm, i'm not so when you're writing bigger checks maybe you get a lot more time face to face yeah but i'm not talking about me personally but i'm talking about most angel investors out there today are all investing through these platforms yeah. and it's just then it's probably tougher but they then they're relying or piggybacking on someone to be doing that right mm-hmm. so but whoever's taking the lead and how uh, how would you recommend they do it take them out for dinner take them out Uh, yeah why not i mean if you read i mean i listen to a lot of us podcasts and i can't quote the names but very uh, well regarded individuals and they talk about it right they take someone out for dinner they see how they treat the staff how they talk to people how you're treating other individuals and this you can only pick up in a in by and of course you have to sort of dig deeper as well i yeah. mean people can put on appearances for a dinner but exactly right how you how you order how do you address someone all those i always found just just eye contact just dropping by someone's office Yeah. I don't know. Of course. That's always the best way to find out how things are. Not a bad idea. But they should be there. <laughs> uh, that that's exactly what I want to know. <laughs> uh what's the last book you read that had a profound impact on you? You know, well, I like Gentleman in Mos- uh A Gentleman in Moscow. Okay, what 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 do you like about that book? I love the character. And that's a fictional book. Yes. I uh, so I prefer fiction. Okay. any day to non fiction versus self help self help yeah yeah those self help books don't work for me <laughs> none of them have ever worked for me i just love the candidness by the way <laughs> uh okay no it just shows i need help but, so and uh, i i think i know the answer to this one what's the one meal you could eat forever is it chocolate or probably yeah probably yeah okay what's one company in your anti portfolio that rankles you even today that you should have done that investment from innoven or seed no, fund from your from your own personal port- portfolio from my own personal portfolio uh early days but i had been uh, from my angel i had been asked if i wanted to do uh simplify this company that we've actually now funded from innoven acha it's in the chem- uh, spe- chem- uh, chemical specialty b2b still early could i could be wrong but looks promising couple more to go uh, what's the one app you you are obsessed with at the moment It's a toss up between Instagram and LinkedIn. Instagram and LinkedIn. Yeah. Wow, those are two completely different. But, but you know, so, honestly, they're getting too similar to each other. Yeah. Right. I feel some some of the stories on LinkedIn or some of those posts on LinkedIn are getting extremely personal. Yeah. Right. And things that should not be shared on <laughs> professional <laughs> platforms. Yeah. Uh, what's a what's a hobby, talent, or skill mm. that most people would not know you possess? Oh God! I wish I had any hobby, talent, or skill that people knew I didn't possess. I'm pretty ordinary. I don't think that I have any skill. Uh, that people running on Marine Drive in the morning <laughs> and swimming. I don't think that's a very ordinary skill to have, <laughs> or ordinary talent to have. Is there anything that you uh, like? I do you like music or anything like that? Oh, I suck. I, I mean, the only thing I can say is that yeah, I can function. I can function with zero sleep. Zero sleep. Well, wow. okay. And that we let's call that as a skill. <laughs> <laughs> a quote or a song that motivates you on a particularly tough day. I don't know about motivating me on a tough day, but I love the quotes from a lot of Tom Cruise quotes. So I love, I love the. Ex- like expression. show me the money. Show me the money. I love the. I love the. Uh, I feel the need for speed. Hmm. I think that's one of my favorite quotes. I'll, my last two questions to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is a piece of advice? or counsel as i would say mm-hmm. that has gu- guided you through the years and who gave it to you i think it's a it's it's maybe a mix so i i think my mom my mom telling me that impossible is in the fool's dictionary and you just have to take chances impossible so, is in the fool's dictionary you just have to take chances i mean both but you know like just just go out there's nothing that's not possible so you just as long do. as you try yeah okay so and last question how would you measure your life <laughs> Oh God, that's tough. The toughest Because, questions are last. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do I measure my life? Uh, well, both personally and professionally. You know how mm-hmm. content I am. And uh, right now, I'd say I still have to figure that piece out. It's mixed. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Ask that, me in ten years. In in ten years, when we have you back for sure. Yeah. So, but thank you so much, Tarana. This has been a fantastic. fantastic interview i think uh, i really love the candidness with the, with the views you have and very unapologetic in many <laughs> ways and that that's 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 definitely a word that always comes to mind because there's a lot of confidence i think also because you've done so many different things and the experiences you've had uh, anything you would like to say before we uh, like a last message to those that, that are listening no i i don't think i have anything last bit but just make sure you tweak some of that stuff <laughs> so i don't get into trouble with my we're peers. not tweaking this last part by the way <laughs> <laughs> so I don't get into trouble on a couple of things. Yet. Thank you, thank you very much, and we'll Shalom. be back again with the next episode. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye.